Okay, um, one day I was downtown with a bunch of friends and we were all just hanging out. We were going to go to a concert, one of my friend's bands. And um, a bunch of these girls from my school don't like me very much because I used to like go to a bunch of concerts and stuff like that. And so um, they ended up telling one of their cousins or something that I called her a bitch. And of course I didn't, and so I was, I, they came towards me, a big group of them, and so I started walking away, and me and my friend um, hid in thorns. And then um, we, they found us, and we were by 25 Central, and she comes up to me, and she gets all up in my face, and is like, oh my god, you called me a bitch, oh, did you call me a bitch? And I was like, I did not call you a bitch, I don't know what you're talking about. And then she just like sets back, and then she punches me, and like, it starts attacking me. The security guard, of course, doesn't do anything, and he's just saying, oh, the cops are coming, the cops are coming, and that's all. And then, um, as he's saying that, she takes the time from beating the crap out of me to pull my hair back and bite down on my neck as hard as she can. And so, then, um, they run away, and the cop comes, talks to me, and then I had to go to the ER, but I got to see my concert anyways. So, yeah. Hello. I have a story to tell. A very gruesome tale. The date was March 20th. And there was a boy, goes by the name of Jack, and he was having a delightful day skiing down the slopes of Berkshire East, avoiding potholes, ice, and various other obstacles that their bad snowmaking cannot fill. When him and two unsuspecting friends, one that happens to be me, were going up the three-person chairlift, not suspecting anything, joking and talking about how much it would suck to fall off the chairlift. It would just not be very fun. So as we arrive at the top, we get off laughing, a joyful laugh that soon turned to horrible fear. When we turned around and saw Jack snagged by the back of his jacket on the raging chairlift. <laughs> he was whipped around the turnstile as the man who was um, operating. operating the chairlift sat there reading his magazine with his feet up. Jack continued to descend the mountain and I rushed towards the man who had his feet up reading the magazine and I yelled, STOP THE CHAIRLIFT! <laughs> well, the man stopped it but it was too late. I looked up to see an empty chairlift. Jack was nowhere in sight. It turns out he had fallen 30 feet without a scratch on him. It was completely safe, but we stayed there for a couple hours anyways. And he got a free helmet. So, my name is Maeve Hughes. I teach dance and movement therapy. And in 1999, I was in a very serious auto accident. I had to learn how to walk again. And so I'm going to demonstrate some of the movement that I did in order to heal my body. I feel great now. Um, I work out and dance every day and I'm a performing touring musician. So, I will just show you a little demonstration. <laughs> I, I can't either, but I just did. So what I'm doing is actually like strengthening my core from a fluid place right now. So a lot of people work out at the gym to do this kind of thing, but you can actually incrementally engage your muscles by engaging one little microfiber at a time. And it bridges like connections through your whole body. You can just have fun too. <laughs> it's nothing like joy to bring you back from near death. <laughs> Thank you. Wisdom hath built her house, she hath hewn her seven pillars. 
She has furnished her table, she has mingled her wine. The stone that the builders refused has become the head of the corner. Righteousness exalteth a nation. Baruch Hashem Abba Echad Tozikenu Adonai Elohim Elohenu Tozikenu Don't fret thyself of Babylon because Babylon is going to burn Don't fret thyself of wickedness because wickedness is going to burn Please let me tell you I love you Please let me tell you, in the name of Jesus, Jahashari Khan, he is the king of kings, conquering I of the tribe of Judah, Lamb who sits atop Mount Zion. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Peace be with you in the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Oh, you come back now. Now what? What are you doing? Are you... <laughs> okay, now, now pick up. This is a lively song in French. So, un, deux, trois. Dieu que la vie est cruelle aux musiciens des ruelles, son copain, son compagnon, c'est l'accordéon. Il regarde dans la tête, son accordéon, accordé, accordé, accordéon. L'aumône à l'accordé, l'accordéon, l'accordé, accordé, accordéon. L'aumône à l'accord et l'accordéon. <laughs> so this one time I was in this um, this little performance that like did like a whole bunch of um, like Christmas songs and stuff like that, right? And um, we did this one song that I was the youngest kid in the adult chorus. It was like a big deal. Like I was like 12 years old, and I was like, I'm in the adult chorus. It was really cool, right? So there I was, the youngest kid in the adult chorus. And we did this song that I really liked, and it was like, um, it was called Brightest and Best, and it was like, Hail the blessed morn, see the great mediator. It was like really cheesy, but I really, really liked it, and it like had this beautiful melody, and I was like, oh, I sound so good singing that song. <laughs> and there was this, um, <laughs> okay, there was this, um, there was like three solos, and it was, there, so there's three verses, and they were all done by this one woman. Oh. Um, they're all done by this one woman, and um, she did them fine, but I, like, in a little 12-year-old bitchy way, I always thought to myself, like, oh, I could do that so much better, and I was like, oh, I wish I had those solos. I wish them so badly that I had them, right? And so, it was the last performance, right? It was a Sunday matinee performance, and um, <clears throat> so the whole group is out there to sing, like, all the backup parts and stuff like that. And everyone's standing there ready, and they start looking around, and everyone starts asking each other, where's the soloist? Where did the soloist go? This is, a, where is the soloist? And everyone was like freaking out, and I was standing there, thinking to myself, oh my god, this is the time, right? <laughs> and actually, like, this is what makes it so cinematic, is that I looked over at my mother, and she said, Susie, sing it. <laughs> And I strode forward with all the grace I could muster. <laughs> and I stood there and I just started to sing. Magically, it was in the right key and everything. And I was just like, Hail the blessed.
let's mourn, see the great mediator. Right? It's like it's like a song about Jesus, right? And I just started singing, and everyone was just like turned and was stunned. <laughs> and um, and then the woman who was the soloist, who apparently had been doing her makeup downstairs, and, like lost track of time. She ended up coming up, like for the and she was and I saw her there, and so then she stood and she did the second verse, and so we were like, okay, okay. And then the director like looks at both of us and like went like that and we sung the last verse together and like I knew all the words because it had been like my favorite solo so it was like it all like came out perfectly and it was beautiful and except for like afterwards I got really scared because you know how like at like the ends of movies like that's like the end of the movie like it was the climax of the movie and I, was, I like I got a like philosophical and I was like the climax of my movie is over <laughs> and I was like I'm going to die now. <laughs> like I thought I was going to die afterwards. That was the only negative part. I ended up making it home though. No car crashes or anything. And um, I still remember it to this day. That story is almost better the third time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> almost. It's a really good story. Third time, really. Yeah. Third. <laughs> the third. <laughs> yeah. This is the most kazutastic version of Satisfaction. That's, that's, that's it. it. That's it. <laughs> okay. This is the most heroic moment of my life. Um, I was about six years old, and I was at a place called Canby Lake Park in Mississippi or Tennessee, something like that. I went on a trip down south with my parents, um, and I was just about this guy's age, actually. <laughs> um, and um, so I was in this like huge like jungle gym thing that. Um, that, that they had there and my sister was in there with with me and you had to like go through this whole big maze and like climb over all these things and it was this little raft out on the water that had all these mazes and stuff inside of it and um there was this slide at the end when you like finally made it through everything you got to the slide and then you could go out and um so my sister had made it before me and she was just a little ways ahead of me and she went down the slide and so I jumped on the slide and I went down after her. And it was one of those tube slides and I remember very vividly, just as I was coming down, I saw this kid just punch my sister in the face. Just this random kid who was probably about eight years old at the time. And I remember getting so angry that I just, I came off the slide and I just went running at him and I said, why don't you pick on somebody your own size? And then I punched him down, and I dragged him to the ground, and I dragged him over to the edge of, of, the, um, of the thing and said, don't you pick on my sister. And then I walked away. And then me and my sister, when we talked to, to someone who was working there, and we told him about the bad boy who punched my sister in the nose and gave her a bloody nose, and he got kicked out of the park. And that's the most heroic moment of my life. Um, once I was just, I was home, and I was just standing there, and the fan wasn't on, nothing was on, and I was, and I felt this big gust of wind. The fan wasn't on, none of the fans or the lights or anything was on. And then, and then I was walking around, I was like, Mom, Alpa, Dad, and I was like, where is everybody? And, yeah, and, and, uh, and then I went into uh, my mom and dad's room and started crying and crying and crying and crying and crying and crying. And then finally my mom came home. I was like, Mom, I was so scared. Was Alta home? Yeah, she was. I was like, ah, Alta. But I, but I yelled Alta thousands of times. I was like, no, she isn't. I, she, she, 
she she didn't say anything when I when I called, but and then I'm like, because because la because that time I um watched this Godzilla movie that was so scary. It was called Gamera, and there's like this dragon thing that ate that eats people and stuff. And um, I and then I was so happy when my when my mom and dad came home. I was like, oh, I'm so revived. The baby. <laughs> I, th I was uh, thought my skull was gonna bear on that. It was just gonna lay on that bed, and then, I was like, Ooh. and I and then I was thinking when I was on the bed. I was when I was on the bed. I I was thinking that my mom and dad were sleeping, and, and that like, big bird thing came in and just. <laughs> grab them both out of bed. <laughs> the blanket was still there, but <laughs> uh, and it was what? <laughs> what? <laughs> and um, I guess that's it. <laughs> so this is the most like bizarre, humiliating situation I've been in. Um. <clears throat> So, it starts out, I was making out with a boy in the woods, and we were ass naked at that point. And um, so, <laughs> there we were in the middle of the woods, ass naked. We thought we were pretty safe, we were a little ways into the woods. And then a bunch of people that we knew from this group come walking by us. And um, so we ran into the woods as quickly as we could, like gathered up as much clothes as possible, right? And we ran into the woods. And so we're deeper into the woods, and we stand there, and we're like, okay, what do we do? And he's like, I don't have any pants. And so there he is without any pants, and we gotta think of what to do. We're in the middle of the woods. And um, so I give him my pants, and he puts on my pants, and he goes running back, and he grabs his, he sneaks around and grabs as much clothes as possible, which I think ended up being all the rest of the clothes, except for I ended up losing both my earrings somehow. And uh, so he runs back, and he like hands me like my bra and underwear. Finally, we have all our clothing on, right? And then we gotta figure out how to get back into the house, right? It's like this big house and it has like um, a few like balconies on it. And so <coughs> we sneak up and we have to go around the group that's just decided to sit in the most inconvenient place possible. And so we have to sneak around the group and we sneak around them. And so we're thinking of a plan, a way to get in. So we figure if we can kind of crawl up this balcony, then just go through this room, right? And then we'll be there. So we crawl up this balcony and we walk into this room, which we think that no one's in. And um, so we walk in and there's a girl sitting there. And we both came in through her balcony window. And we just go, um, what's going on? We just thought we'd pop in to say hello. <laughs> and we ended up having a conversation with her and she didn't seem to notice that it was weird that we came through her window. So then we walk back out into the hall and um, everyone sees us and they're like, where have you been? And <laughs> we just go, uh, we were just around, you know, just, just around. So it ended up being okay. But it was a very funny, bizarre situation to be in. This morning, I was trying to wake up Alpha. I was like, Alpha, wake up, wake up! And, and, then I, and then I went out of her room thinking, and I had this really loud horn, but I couldn't, but I couldn't find it, so I, um, so I um, like got these random stuff to, and banged it on the wall. I was like, Alta, now is your body woke up? Because she, her eyes were opened. And I was like, Alta, now is your body woke up? And then I'm like, no. <laughs> and, and then I was, and then I was like, um, and then I was, then I went, <laughs> and then I went, um, I forgot that other part. Oh yeah, and then then I went back into the room, started playing, got scared again, and then um, I came, I came, I came into Alta's room, and then I, I slammed another thing on the wall. I was like, "Now is your body woke up, Alta?" <laughs> and then she's like, "No." <laughs> and then um, and then like Dad was came, and then um, and then like he woke Alta up, and then. She just went to bed on my bed, 
and then that are, and then dad was like that isn't that isn't making the bed up that isn't putting the bed up on the sofa and then it's like okay and then she does it and then he's like she didn't make the blankets all right and they're like you're not making the blankets <laughs> and then she makes the blankets and then she goes back to see him I'm like oh, I can't play <laughs> And and then and then I was like, and then I just sat on the couch for a while. But, oh, then I remembered the TV. Then I started watching it, and that's it. One of the most amazing coincidences that I have ever experienced happened on a New Year's Eve. Um, I was just going with my friends to walk down to some. In a place like Divas, I suppose. It had a different name back then, but we were going to go celebrate New Year's Eve there. And as I walked along with this little crew of friends, they mentioned the song Old Lang Syne, you know, and someone said, I never understood what Old Lang Syne is all about. What is that, Old Lang Syne? <laughs> and I said, Well, I have a, a, a reaction to it, a feeling about it. It means that, you know, some friends that seem so dear and so important and in the center of your heart and life right now time will pass and they'll be almost like strangers to you and that and and so it's saying should old acquaintance be forgot you know as precious as a friendship seems now maybe there'll be a time when when it isn't so important and that the and and for somehow that song is poignant for me about that and I, I for some reason mentioned that when I was a little girl I had a, my very best friend who was a toddler um, and I would wear um, funny little leopard one sh on off one shoulder suits and dance around a totem pole that she had in her yard and how we loved each other so and that I once tried to run away from home and walked an, a mile at the age of three just to be with this friend because <laughs> I loved her so much but how I've never seen her since and 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 uh, you know she's completely lost to me but one time she was the most precious jewel and then as and as we approached the uh, and I told the people the name of this friend, Mary Catherine. And as I approached the, the discotheque, I went inside and I hadn't remembered my ID. And so I, I and, and as I had been walking in, I thought to myself, oh my goodness, that, that woman looks as though she could be Mary Catherine. But I'm simply thinking it because of the fact that I mentioned her for the first time in, in 20 years. And, and and so I walked, So, but after I got turned away from the, the disco, I walked back out on the porch and the woman looked at me and she said, Beverly? And it was Mary Catherine. It was the person that I had never mentioned all that time. It was the person I just told that story about. I, I, was, I was in shock. And my friends that were all with me were all witness to this strange coincidental miracle because they all couldn't believe it either. 